standing on the deck of a Panuxen, Admiral Yi Sun Shin looks across the Myongyang Strait at 330 Japanese ships. He's been commanded by King Sun Jo of Korea to scuttle his fleet and join the ground forces under the command of General Kwan Yul in a last ditch defense of the Korean court, which has been pushed back to the border with China. Admiral Yi sends a letter back to the king, replying, Your Highness, I still have 12 ships. He found one more before the Japanese arrived. He picked the battlefield. Myongyang has a very peculiar and predictable feature. The current in this strait is very powerful, pushing it 10 knots in one direction, then every three hours, switching directions. Even so, the Japanese armada was staggering. 130 warships protecting 200 troop transport and supply ships. Even not counting the secondary ships, Admiral Yi is outnumbered more than 10 to 1. Yet, with his military brilliance, tactics, drilling of his sailors, and the desperation that comes from people with nothing left to lose, they fought against this giant fleet. In the end, about 30 Japanese ships lay at the bottom of the sea. The Koreans suffered 10 casualties, and no ships were lost. When you talk about naval commanders in history, a few names pop up. Horatio Nelson comes up a lot. He commanded the British Navy against Napoleon's forces, and his record is amazing. 13 battles, eight of them victorious against the French during the Napoleonic Wars. But to put that into perspective, Admiral Yi fought 13 battles against the Japanese during the Imjin War, and he won every single one of them. In 14 of those battles, he left no Japanese ships afloat. And for the duration of the war, Admiral Yi Sun Shin did not lose a single vessel. The Imjin War was a monumental conflict. It was a campaign that would shape the history of Japan for the next 250 years, and secured for Korea its ability to exist as a culture and people. Yet, outside of that area of the world, and some history enthusiasts, not many people really know about this period of history. And I for one think that's a shame. What I want to do is discuss a bit about the Imjin War and the era involved to give you the tools to use this conflict in your own tabletop game. If you love samurai, pirates, underdog stories, resistance fighters, and the idea of firing a cannon broadside into an enemy before boarding their ship with swords, well, lower your sails and hold on to your rudder, folks, because I'm Legal Kimchi, and we're about to set sail into another alternate world. Chapter 1. The End of the Sengoku Jidai. A note on pronunciation. What little Korean I know, I speak with an American accent. And it makes my mother very disappointed. Further apologies for my Japanese pronunciation. During the 16th century, Korea was a small kingdom that was living in relative peace. Sure, there were some Jurchen raiders, kind of like Mongolians, as they were also pastoral agrarian tribespeople and they had to deal with some pirates, but they never got into a land war in Asia because they knew about the most famous of the classic blunders. Enter the Japanese. Hundreds of thousands of troops sporting the latest in military technology, battle-hardened from over a hundred years of civil war. After Hideyoshi Toyotomi, a truly impressive person who rose from the ranks of sandal bearer to the military ruler of all Japan had united the country, he looked to the east to the prize of Asia. China. But you can't just land in China. You need to go around. The Japanese had been fighting a civil war for over a hundred years, but that did not require or really utilize much in the way of sea battles. I mean, they're still formidable in the ocean, but they really like to get in close and invade with boarding parties. So they land in Korea. Being Korean, I would love to discuss the grit and determination of the Korean military in their defense of the homeland. I would love to talk about how cooler heads prevailed and leadership planned and executed a brilliant counterattack. But in reality, the Korean government was a vile, 
corrupt bureaucracy filled with inept leaders almost across the board. They made a series of terrible decisions, had not really adopted firearms at this point, and fielded a weak, ineffectual military, and they kept demoting good officers purely for political reasons. Only two things worked for them in their fight against the Japanese as the terrifying armies of samurai rampaged through the land. The common people and Admiral Yi Sun Shin. And I think both of these would make a really sweet RPG campaign. Chapter 2. The Righteous Armies So you are a Korean peasant farmer. Your land has been taken, your friends slaughtered, and a handful of you, and some Buddhist monks, are all that's left of your village. The Korean army has been smashed from pillar to post, and your king is sitting at the Chinese border, hoping that the Ming Dynasty sees this large force of angry samurai and come to save the day. What do you do? Well... They formed guerrilla fighting units and took the fight to the rear of the Japanese lines, cutting supplies and completely disregarding the idea of a direct fight with the superior Japanese forces. It was classic asymmetrical warfare. The Japanese were shocked that this was happening. They felt the Korean people would just submit to Japanese rule when the Japanese steamrolled the Korean leadership. But these folks had just watched the slaughter of their friends and family and felt they had nothing more to lose. This was an army fueled by spite, ready to hurt you in any way they could, just to see you in pain. And if you've ever met my mother, you would understand that many of those traditions live on in Koreans to this day. So how does this work for your RPG campaign? The party are the survivors. Their village is destroyed. Their mentors are gone. A handful of villagers gather, and there's no one left to protect them. Your characters take up arms and fight back. The introductory adventure can be them surviving the initial attack, even making multiple characters and playing the one that survives. We then follow those heroes as they find weapons to defend themselves. This can mix elements of a post-apocalyptic campaign, as the society of the characters is completely destroyed. You can utilize this in a story-based game, where the characters are trying to liberate the area from invaders, rescuing NPCs along the way, culminating in a titanic battle against the daimyo in charge. Or you can run a sandbox game, where the characters can just choose if they want to fight to free their kingdom, or try to escape to China, or whatever the fantasy analog is for you. They may choose to join the invaders, or they may use this opportunity to establish their own domain. The devastation from the invaders could release some ancient evil that was held since time immemorial, and was released by the invaders removing the guardians. The possibilities here are endless. But what if you like pirates? Chapter 3. Roaring Currents So you like pirates? Here's the great thing about this particular time in history. The Koreans had cannons on their ships. Their mastery of that weapon gave them a competitive advantage in this area against the Japanese fleets. They didn't really have guns. They were not adopters of firearms. So you're looking at firing broadsides like an Age of Sail pirate, and then boarding with swords and bows. Except those swords look like this. That's the Korean gom. Look familiar? Well, I won't get into a debate about who made it first, but the two sides here are using very similar swords. And to be honest, I can't really tell the difference between the two. Now the history here offers a campaign where you can fight against the invasion fleet. Communication with the king would be hard to come by. You're basically an independent ship running a campaign against the invaders. But think about it. Looting supply ships, taking gold, raiding ports, firing cannons, sword fighting boarding parties, sinking ships, working for imperialist invaders. I mean, what is a pirate game if not those things? And if you don't want to utilize a narrative of the invaders, then you can just have a pirate campaign where you are independent sailors going from island to mainland, avoiding the authorities. And the fun of the pirate adventure is that you can incorporate a myriad of different cultures as you sail from port to port. Now, I include cannons in my campaign setting, but if you don't like that, you can easily swap it out with just magic users. There really isn't much of a mechanical difference between a cannonball and a fireball, and the idea that the fireball would ignite the deck of a ship makes ship combat with magic users even more dangerous. But they aren't mutually exclusive. 
I like the idea of having cannons being a direct response to magic users, people wanting to defend themselves without having to rely on paying the wizard's guild or bringing on a sorcerer no one can trust. Not everyone can shoot a fireball, but anyone can be trained to shoot a cannon. I remember that old saying, God created man, but Samuel Colt made them equal. In my campaign setting, I actually have a specific family holding on to the secret of the black powder. They have this technology to fight against the wizards of the world and to kind of balance the playing field. So you can use it or not use it as you wish. Chapter 4. Appendix K. So finding English language sources are really hard for this period in history. Outside of Wikipedia, there is little in the way of resources for this. For the more historically minded, I recommend The Imjin War by Samuel J. Hawley. He also has a YouTube series that covers what he covers in his book. It's pretty informative. Extra Credits also did an extra history series on Admiral Yi Sun Shin. But to give you an idea about that, they comment how the most negative source about the life of Admiral Yi was his own autobiography. So take it with a grain of salt. For more D&D related resources, I recommend Koryo Hall of Adventurers. It was written by a French author living in Korea. Daniel Kwan actually did some editing on that book and I backed it on Kickstarter. It does get some things wrong in the sense that some of it is not true to the history or culture of Korea. Like for instance, Korea really doesn't have an animist history. The religion of Korea is much more deity based, but it gets most of it right. And you can take from it pretty confidently. I use parts of the book in my campaign, and the book actually comes with a pretty cool campaign setting and a map. The writer also includes an Appendix K of Korean media that you can draw inspiration from. Personally, I recommend the movie Admiral Roaring Currents. I want to note that it is a dramatization and a little bit of Korean propaganda, but it also is a really well done historical movie and very much worth the watch. So go out, add a little Korea into your campaign world. And I hope you like the taste of my culture. And if you do, go read more and use it in your game. Thanks for watching, folks. A uh, little bit of a channel news update. I have a Twitch. The link is down below, so please give me a follow. I sometimes do late night streams about RPGs, sharing DM advice, and talking about whatever you folks want to talk about. So feel free to come hang out. If you want to help this channel, please share, retweet, and spread it around social media. For more content like this, please be sure to subscribe and hit that bell icon so that you're notified when a new video drops. At this point, I'm releasing a new one about once every two weeks. Let's continue the discussion in the comment section down below. I really hope this video gives you a couple of ideas that you can use in your game. Because, as always, I want you to roll dice, roll play, and roll with it.